everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, um, everybody. Um, I think we've got a few people on, so and it's already two minutes past. So I think let's just kick off, and it is recorded. So anyone who's joining late or um, hasn't managed to join this time will be able to see the recording later. So yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Vicky Halley, and I'm joined by, by Rajneesh Singh. Um, and great to have you with us here today. My background is tax technology and tax transformation. I joined Regan Van Roy earlier this year, and previous to that was at a um, at PwC as the digital transformation lead for Africa. And I also have quite a lot of in-house experience. I was with um, one of the big banks in South Africa for forever and a day, over 15 years, um, driving and leading their global tax reporting and compliance. And I am joined by Rajneesh, who is a director in our transfer pricing team, and he leads the Irish transfer pricing team in the office there in Dublin. And I will hand over to him to introduce himself and he can tell you a bit more about the TP in Ireland. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Rajneesh Singh. I'm a transfer pricing director with Regan Van Roy. My background goes on, I have 15 years of experience in transfer pricing, mostly with the big four in UK, Ireland, Singapore, and other Asian countries. Uh, I have worked on all aspects of transfer pricing, compliance, controversy, and TP restructuring and structuring models as well. Um, in terms of client, I've handled a range of clients from small, medium enterprises to large MNCs over the period of 15 years. So yeah, kind of seen the landscape of transfer pricing across jurisdiction. That's in brief about me. Uh, the discussion why we have is how the transfer pricing international landscape, where we are in 2024, and where is Ireland in there? Let me admit somebody joining in. So, so as we have seen in the news, you know, Ireland has often been in the news for one of the other purposes in transfer pricing with Apple, Facebook, and various other firms coming in and you calling in. There are various tax rulings in favor of that, you know, where on and off we have seen, you know, positives and negative news coming out of it. And as we know, OECD has been very strict in, in terms of shifting a profit in transfer pricing. And it was high time that Ireland wanted to be in line with the global taxation, where the fair share of tax should be charged. And to align with international inclusive framework of BEPS guideline, Ireland very soon decided to join the global wagon led by OECD. The main purpose was that to remain in touch with the international best practices and to foster a transparent and equi equitable tax environment. Now, what has actually happened is that international landscape is changing fast. There's a paradigm shift in global taxation. Old international laws were more aligned with legalistic approach. And what OECD tries to do is to align it with value creation and economic substance, align with where people are actually performing functions they're employing assets and assuming risk while performing the function. So OECD has been trying to align the, with the function asset and risk. And Ireland has recently take few, taken few steps to align with the OECD guidelines. So let's do a brief update on where Irish TP regulations are. What are the new things which have come in 2023-24? So as, we, as some of us would know, Transfer pricing actually started guidelines back in 2010 when it was introduced as part 35A of Taxes Consolidation Act, uh, 1997. And over the period of nine years, you know, we had a substantial increase in 2019 where there was a substantial change in Taxes Consolidation Act again, where pre-2010 companies who are performing any kind of transfer pricing or any kind of uh, related party transactions were also included. Then we have seen substantial changes in 2020, 21, and 22. 
Now, in 2022, primarily the main change was that Irish TP regulations have been aligned with OECD TP guidelines of 2022. Now, what it has done is that it has added the three subsequent TP guidelines on transaction profit split method, on financial transactions, and in restructuring. So these things have been aligned as per the latest OECD TP guidelines. On 18 December 2023, which is very recently, last December, in order to strengthen the TP compliance, Irish TP revenue has introduced Part 35A0105. Now, this is primarily to update the requirement of TP guidelines. This is to look at what, when the Irish taxpayers are submitting the new the large taxpayer division, they want they wanted to look into certain aspects in order to ensure that the compliance is there. As the first step, they introduce certain standard that, okay, these are the requirements for submitting TP documentation. These are the in line with OECD TP guidelines. Very recently, in 11th April, April 2024, Irish revenue further added a requirement that to ensure that there is no shifting of there is no uh, shifting of profit to ensure that the profits are taxed and there is no double non-taxation of profit. So first time they have introduced uh, withholding tax on outbound payments, and subsequently on 26th April 2024, Irish again updated the TP guidelines on bilateral APA. So now they you can file an APA through digital means. Now, there are clear guidelines on when a taxpayer wants to negotiate, when is the deadline that you can stop negotiating, when is the deadline you need to file, and to make it easier, you can do it online. So if you see recently from last December to May 2024, there have been series of uh, steps re taken by revenue, and revenue has been very busy to align Irish TP guidelines in line with the global OECD TP guidelines. So, in summary, uh, Irish taxpayer wants to know what are the compliance. So let's refresh the basic TP compliance. If you, if your global if your group has a global revenue turnover of two fifteen million euros or more, you are supposed to prepare a master file and submitted the Irish TP revenue, Irish revenue on request. If your group revenue is 50 million euros or more, you are subject to prepare a local file and only submit your revenue upon request. Uh, the TP rule also apply to any capital transaction if they're subject to a threshold of 25 million. And obviously the CBCR reporting aligns with the global requirement of 750 million euros of group revenue turnover. Now, the important thing, you know, when we need to note is that in order to get details where which section actually aligns with TP guidelines and which section actually details about the TP guidelines requirement, you need to refer Section 835G2, which details the Irish TP documentation requirement. And it, the Irish TP guidelines requires the master file, local file to be prepared by the time you file the income tax return of the subsequent financial year. You will get a 30 days time when I receive a request to submit the TP documentation. And then subsequently, there are penalties and tax gate penalties if we don't comply to the guidelines. So this was, you know, a brief uh, refresher of the updated TP guidelines. And what exactly I receive has been busy with last six months and seven months where there were substantial changes. But what we have seen recently, there's a spurt of TP audit happening. Irish Revenue has recently in the annual report, they have said that they have earned a substantial revenue of the tax from transfer pricing. And we have seen series of client cases where transfer pricing is one of the main reasons where Irish Revenue has been asking for many audits. Now, the primary question of taxpayer is that what exactly you know, triggers a TP audit? What can we do better? So that you know we don't get into the list of companies which will be selected for TP audit. Based on our experience, what we have seen that if the Irish taxpayer, if they are persistently making losses or they are very low profit margins, 
then Irish Seven is interested to see if these are reasons for transfer pricing. If there's an inconsistent profit loss pattern, or if there's a significant amount of related party transactions, that means significant in amount of related party transactions in terms of revenue or cost, then there could be potential of shifting of profit and Irish revenue may be interested in looking if everything is in line as per the market. So another thing which triggers out is intergroup service fees. Globally, this is one of the key related party transaction and Irish revenue is no far apart. Any intergroup service, they are very keen. There's a sudden drop in profit after tax incentive in expires, then Irish revenue is re really keen that what happened and let us look if, it, if there's a transfer pricing issue. And obviously, last but not the least, trading entity with tax havens. So if we are if we are trading with another related company which is in tax haven, then Irish revenue is very interested in checking whether things are as per the law, as per the transfer pricing guidelines. So these are the key TP audit triggers we have seen in last year or so. Now, if we delve in detail in terms of related party transaction, what are the transactions which have been primarily into focus? The use of intangible, be it brand, be it trademark, be it any other intellectual property, Iris Stephanie has been very keen in looking at if it is done as per arm's length. Intergroup services, as we discussed, any financial assistance, any loans, perpetual loss making companies, and obviously, least but not the least, TP non-compliance that you have often we have seen many taxpayers is, have not prepared local file in time or master file in time. Or maybe the group has the master file, but they, ha they haven't got the access to the master file in time. And upon request, the taxpayer needs to produce within 30 days. So those are the ETP audit triggers which we have seen recently. Let's get into current TP issues. What are the current TP issues which in last 2023-24 we have seen based on working with many of our clients? So as we discussed intellectual property, so let's delve into detail. So primarily we have seen, you know, various uh, process related intangible, product related intangible, any transfer of intangible from one jurisdiction to another the valuation needs to be done, a transfer pricing valuation needs to be done and needs to ensure that it is done as per the arm's length or market. So in, when we are preparing transfer pricing uh, review, we need to check whether the intangible is classified as hard to value intangible. So when we say hard to value intangible means where comparable is very difficult to find or where the intangible is in mid process and we are not able to see the end result. So there is no certainty in terms of intangible. So those kind of cat categorize as hard to value intangible. And as per the tax requirement, uh, the tax taxpayer as well as the tax advisor needs to report within 30 days to revenue that there is a transfer initiated from one jurisdiction to another. And this is again an EU requirement and it will be automatically shared between the EU member states. So any, any intangible, if it is categorized as hard to value intangible, there is a requirement that within 30 days of initiating transfer, taxpayers or the tax advisors need to inform the revenue. So this is one of the key area where EP audit triggers. Again, high value service transaction, primarily intergroup service transaction. Revenue is very interested to know that, you know, actually services have been rendered and the services are as per the arm's length. So when we say actually services rendered means it is not just legalistic, but actually there is, the service has some economic value or it is saving cost. Again, headquarters and management service transactions falls in the same criteria. The next and the most important is intercompany financial transaction. In last couple of years, we have seen revenue focusing a lot on loans and they are ensuring, you know, not only the focus is on whether there is an arm's length interest rate charge, but primarily a debt capacity analysis, whether to determine if a loan is considered as a loan. And if company who is taking loan has the capacity to take such loan, or whether in a third party case scenario, whether this company would have got a loan of that amount. So a debt capacity analysis has been performed. Then we check whether a loan is as per arm's length. 
So these are the current TP issues of we have seen a lot in, uh, in with our clients in transferizing cases. Then we see procurement structures. Now, often procurement structures, we have the primary procurement entity either lying in a tax haven or say low tax jurisdiction. Even if it is in another tax jurisdiction, the most important question is whether it has substance. On a legalistic way, they are procuring for the group companies, but whether the right people are there who are performing that function, whether the actual function is being performed from that location, or is it being done legalistic on paper and actual function is being performed in the local tax jurisdiction. So procurement structures are one of the key areas where we have seen recently a spurt of TP audit being triggered whenever there is a susceptibility that there could be a lack of substance or economic substance. Limited risk entity structure, we very, we sometimes see, you know, very carelessly, some of the like limited risk distributor or a contract manufacturer has been classified, but then the substance says that they might not be limited risk. They are performing more function. They are having more advertising and promotion expenses in the local tax jurisdiction. They might have an intangible. And the question of limited risk characteristics may be under question. And they should have earned much more profit like a full-fledged distributor or a full-fledged manufacturer. So any limited risk entity structures are also in the focus of uh, revenue. Then, you know, often we say in transfer pricing, we shouldn't look at one side. We should look at the two-sided enterprise. price. So when we see, in, you know, iris related transfer pricing tra transactions where the tested party, say, is in another country, but so we are focusing more on the tested party side and not on the other side of the transfer pricing. So two-sided nature of transfer pricing is also under much focus, you know, where the tested party and the related companies are at market length, are at arm's length price. That is one of the key area. And the last but not the least is limitations of deductibility of cost. This again goes back to the loan, whether a loan is considered as a loan or should be considered as an equity based on the debt capacity analysis, and there's a limitations on deduction of cost related to those things. The current TP issues, if we can block up, if we delve in further detail, as we briefly touched out, is profitability. Wherever, if there's a significant loss or a consistent loss, or if you're making low profit, profitability is the key criteria of any audit being triggered. Intergroup services, management fee, support fee, technical fee are also one of the key criteria. Wherever there's a CUP analysis being performed, CUP is one of the transfer, five transfer pricing method. CUP means a direct to direct market comparison. So often the revenue has seen that the market comparison direct to direct, um, there is a lack of materiality. That means you know it has to be an apple to apple comparison. If there's a small change or small lacking of comparison, the materiality level needs to be adjusted. A proper adjustment needs to be performed, which has often been seen missing when we look at CUP because CUP is very strict and it, it looks at exact comparable. So we have seen a lot of PP audits been happening in CUP is properly applied or not. As we discussed in intangible royalty payments, very recently we've seen a big pharmaceutical giant and you know where they have with another European entity, they're paying a royalty and Irish revenue. We have been dealing with more than a year that Irish revenue is very interested in the royalty payment for the pharmaceutical giant is at arm's length, and uh, it's and they are looking because when we pay, there is a correlative adjustment in Ireland, and Irish revenue is not easily taking that. They are, they want to ensure that the payment made in terms of royalty makes sense. It is an actual intangible as classified. Where is the DEMPI, where is the development, enhancement and maintenance protection of the IP is happening. And this is a case going on for more than a year. So we have to be very careful in terms of when we are making any royalty payments, we need to ensure the intangible is classified as intangible and the owner, who where is the economic owner versus legal ownership. So legally, another related company may own the intangible is it owning economically means that you know proper development function the enhancement function the key control function is happening in that entity or is it happening locally 
So those are the points of audit trigger. Intercompany function, as we already discussed in terms of loan, interest-free loans are not at arm's length. So often we hear that, you know, Ireland is getting an interest-free loan, so we shouldn't be worried about. Yes, because if Ireland is paying any interest, we need to ensure that they are at arm's length. But if Ireland is receiving an interest-free loan, what is the issue? Revenue is looking at, you know, deeming the interest rate and then checking whether our tax is due in Ireland. So if Ireland was making a payment of interest as per arm's length, what would be the amount? And then deeming that as an interest rate and then charging a tax on that profit. So yes, it's no more safe if Ireland is not even making a payment in terms of interest-free loan. Those are one of the top audit triggers. Last, but one of the most interesting, at ANP expenses, which we call in TP, advertising and promotion expenses. So often we see in limited risk distributor or say contract manufacturer, if they are spending substantial amount in advertising and promotional expenses, then whether the company should still be characterized as a limited risk or should be characterized as a full fledged distributor. So the ANP, the advertising and promotion expenses compared to a normal other limited risk distributor in a third party case scenario and checked whether they are the same market rate. And if not, then the transfer pricing characterization changes and then not be retained limited risk criteria. So these are the current TP issues which we have seen in the last couple of years primarily. Now getting into detail, profitability is one of the key areas which we have seen. Taxpayers needs to justify if they're making losses is not because of transfer pricing purposes, but because of business and economic reason. Then you, we need to maintain contemporaneous transfer pricing documentation where we clearly exemplify that all our related party transactions are at arm's length, are at market rate, and hence, the losses of the business economic reason is not because of transfer pricing, but because of commercial and economic reason. What are the issues which we have seen tax authorities are revenue raising in terms of intergroup services? First of all, as we expect, the TP documentation needs to support the arm's length nature of the services. But in the TP documentation, we need to actually explain the nature of services rendered and benefit received. Now, when we say nature of services rendered and benefit received means uh, the services which you have rendered, whether there was a benefit to the other side. We need to present a documentary evidences that some services have been rendered. The TP documentation also exemplify what is the basis of charge and the profit markup. How have we established in the team? The profit markup, how did we come up with that? Say, for example, we did a benchmarking economic analysis of a third party companies, and from that we found a range of markup which we chose to use it. We need to demonstrate that. We also need to explain the allocation key used. What are the allocation key for cost or revenue, which we are, when we are charging intergroup services. We also need to provide the shed schedule and the workings, how the charge is computed, and often, you know, the devil lies in the detail where revenue gets an opportunity to do challenge and conduct an audit. As we discussed in CUP, the related party pricing versus third party pricing, it's an apple to apple comparison. So if there is a comparable information available, but it's a very far fetched information, it's not an exact comparable. And if there are small changes or small material differences, whether an accurate adjustment has been done for those to eliminate those material differences. Often revenue has found that the small material differences were overlooked and still it was considered as an apple to apple comparison. Revenue is very keen in ensuring that those material differences has been eliminated through proper adjustment. Cup shouldn't be used. Some other transfer pricing method should be used. The other issue raised as we discussed recently, you know, lot of audit triggers in terms of royalty payments. So the question which are being asked by revenue is that, what is the purpose of the royalty? And what is the benefit of using IP? If you're using that IP, what is the Irish taxpayer getting a benefit? And if that payment is worth the profit or the benefit, how is the royalty rate you have determined? Have you done an economic analysis? What is the jurisdiction? 
will there be any updates or improvement during the licensing period? So while you are the licensing and you're making royalty payments, is there being updates being performed? Uh, does the company contribute to the development of IT? Means does the local entity contribute to the development of IT IP? If they have any role and if they are being compensated, the roles and responsibilities of who owns the IP. Again, the question of legal ownership versus economic ownership. Legally, on paper, the entity might be owning the IP, but it, it, for economic ownership, it is required the control of development, enhancement, maintenance, and protection and exploitation of IP should be with that entity. The routine function can be outsourced, but in that entity, somebody should be there in that management control position who is managing the whole development of IP, the enhancement of IP, the maintenance of IP. If that control doesn't lie in that organization, then maybe that entity may not be an economic owner. And hence, the return would be shifted to the economic owner and not to the legal owner. So this is where revenue is coming from. Then obviously the terms of the royalty agreement is also under question. So these are the primary questions which we have seen revenue asking when we are determining royalty payments and intangibles. In loan, the first question which Raven is asking, is it a loan? So the, the interesting is that, yes, obviously it's a loan, no. In order to classify as a loan, we need to first see the debt capacity analysis and whether the entity is eligible for such a loan. In a third party scenario, whether that entity would have been given so much loan. So if, based on debt capacity analysis, if IS Avenue finds out that, okay, the entity was only worth of X amount of loan and not Y, so the remaining amount may not be categorized as a loan and can be used as an investment in equity or other purposes, but they, it may not be characterized as loan and hence no deductions will be allowed. So again, the next question where interest is being applied, taxpayer must be able to justify that interest rate is at arm's length. That is the second point. And the last, in the case of interest-free loan, as we said, the revenue could seek to make an adjustment. Uh, the deemed interest income. As you said, even if you have an interest-free loan revenue, let's say there would be a deemed interest income and then the taxpayer should be paying a number tax on that deemed interest income. So even if Ireland is giving an interest-free loan, revenue is interested and may make adjustments. So as we all know, interest-free loans are not arm's length, it's not at market. Third party would never give an interest-free loan. It can only happen in group company and revenue is empowered to deem interest income if they choose to do so. Uh, the ANP expenses. So the ANP expenses recently has been in a lot of focus. This was seen long back in eight to 10 years back, in almost all the cases in transpassing cases in US, you know, where there was a very common, famous line, bright line test which they would do. They would compare similar third party, the US IRS would compare similar third party companies with the uh, local companies and check out whether they are spending equal amount in ANP expen expenses. Irish Revenue is very interested in and looking at it whether when we are characterizing an entity as a limited risk entity, if they are crossing that bright line test or they are in simpler terms, they are spending more than a limited risk distributor would have applied or a contract manufacturer would have spent. And if, if they are spending so much in the local market, then are they creating a market intangible? And if they're creating a market intangible, then they should be earning a profit or a royalty for the market intangible. So the question on limited risk comes into picture, the question of creating a marketing intangible comes into picture and hence these can clearly trigger audit. Common mistakes. So often we have seen taxpayers, you know, often either an innocent or an ignorant mistake. We have seen when we talk about that, hey, have do you have a local TP file? Have you prepared TP compliance document? Or uh, we have seen taxpayers saying, oh, we have an agreement. We have an intercompany agreement. Or we have seen that I didn't know I need to keep the records. So even if you have a transfer pricing document, you need to keep the records that, you know, the services have been rendered. They have been cost allocated and the you know the key allocation the allocation keys the way the cost has been allocated the markup those then didn't know that those they thought that just the agreement is good enough uh we have also heard that i'm part of the group and therefore i need to pay for it there's not much i can say about it the revenue would not listen to that and they would 
want to ensure that you are treating you're actually acting as a third party company would have done in a similar scenario. We have also seen Backspace saying I received a debit note and I pay based on that. I don't know much details about it. Or they say the headquarters says that they have all the supporting schedules. We don't have it. Or we are only a subsidiary and we can't question our parent. Uh, unfortunately, the revenue will ask the finance head or the finance in charge responsible to provide the details of the cost that if you were making a payment third party, would you be doing the same? Those are the questions being asked. Again, we see the basis of charge applied consistently worldwide. So what is wrong? Ireland is also paying. We are pay in the group. Everybody's paying same. That doesn't take away from the responsibility of preparing a TP documentation and justifying the related party transaction is conducted at arm's length. We need to prove the liability of proof is on tax payers that whatever we are paying is similar market. We have global regional TP documentation. Revenue is interested in local TP documentation where the local company is conducting transactions at the arm's length. They will open your audited financial statement. They will look at your related party transactions. And if they are significant, they will request you for a TP documentation. If you qualify for a master file, they'll ask you for a master file. And if you cannot produce them, then subsequent penalties are then in line. Pricing is determined by headquarters. You and I both know revenue is not going to listen to that. In a third party case scenario, if you would be deciding whether the pricing is at arm's length is at market or not, and you should be participating in this, deciding the pricing and all the calculations should be with you. We have also seen that we have market data, as we said in Capino, an apple to apple comparison. That is very good if you have market data, but we need to demonstrate that it's an actual apple to apple comparison. There's no material differences, and that needs to be documented in transfer pricing documentation or the local file, ensuring material differences adjustments have been made and the transfer pricing is, is the related party transaction is conducted at arm's length. So just having marketing data will not be enough. We also seen that no tax loss to government. What's the problem? So these are the kind of uh, innocence questions we have seen from taxpayers. Uh, and uh, this is also one of the reasons why there is a spurt of PP audits happening. We thought of delving a little bit more on the intergroup services. So primarily, you know, intergroup services as classified by OECD uh, is technical services, head office services, or we use the term shared services. We have market support, IT support, any back office, HR, legal, IT consulting, procurement, characterized under this kind of transaction. Often we see that taxpayers say, these are low value added services, and hence we are using the OECD guidelines to charge a cost plus five markup. We don't need to do something TP guidelines because we are going to the low value added services. It is very, very important and it's key to understand what are low value added services and what are high value added services. So any finance, accounting, bookkeeping, audit, or any kind of account receivable is low value added services. HR support, recruitment, yes, it can be characterized as low value. Legal support, public relation, IT support, Often we see colleagues or taxpayers confused between IT support and IT consulting. IT support is the general office kind of support, that desktop support, which we see in our IT team helping us with various cloud or any issues with laptop. Those are characters as IT support. IT consulting is nothing but customized software development. You are creating a small app or small system to talk to SAP or your internal ERP or CRM. Those are considered as IT consulting they may not be characterized as a low value. That would be characterized as a high value added. And hence, you cannot use cost plus 5% markup. Similarly, general admin services will be low value. Now, what are high value? Any strategic management services, any executive management services, so CEO, CFO level serve, if they're providing anything, those are strategic management. As we discussed, IT consulting, marketing services, Legal support is fine with low value, but legal consulting, like a lawyers, those could be characterized as a high value. R&D services, manufacturing, low manufacturing doesn't come under intergroup, but often we have seen 
how taxpayers getting confused between this purchase, sales, extraction, exploration. These are all high value added services and need a proper benchmark and economic analysis to be performed based on the function performed, assets employed, and risk assumed by each of the taxpayers. So we need to very clearly appreciate and understand the difference between low value adding versus and high value adding services. A service benefit test is required for intergroup services. So primarily, we need to make sure we have to prove that there's an economic value which has been transferred. How do we decide? So there's, uh, there are two steps. It's called benefit test needs to be performed in your TP documentation and willingness to pay test. So benefit test actually needs to exemplify that when services have been rendered, that either has the, the local entity has been profitable because of that, or was able to save cost. So they need to demonstrate the economic value being rendered because of the services. So th this could be either saving of cost or in terms of increase in profit. Then the willingness to pay test is to demonstrate that in case of a third party for same similar services, would the local entity would be willing to pay for such kind of services? We need to demonstrate, demonstrate in order to ensure that the service rendered has a benefit and of economic value. Now we see the next three shareholding activities. Now any group parent company performing any activities in terms of shareholder, like you know, they're consolidating the uh, financials, that is part of the shareholder duties, and that cannot be considered as an intergroup services. Duplicative services, you have an HR and but the parent company and the local entity also has HR and they're performing same. So then there is no why do you need that service if you have a HR performing the same function? So duplicative services will not be allowed. Incidental benefit. For example, the parent company, because of their local reasons, you know, they are investing a huge amount of marketing effort in the local to increase the brand. Now you being part of the group, you're having an incidental benefit, but the parent company cannot ask you to pay for it. Because the parent company is not specifically investing for the local entity. It is investing as a group, as a group parent. So if there are any incidental benefit, you being part of the group means that the local entity being part of the group is enjoying, should not be considered as an intergroup services. So we need to be careful and mindful of these. The primary, the allocation key is one of the key areas. How are we allocating service cost? Often we see turnover. That's why you see it's highlighted. We say, should we do a turnover? What revenue it rates is, it's a service. There's a cost included in it. The cost could be based on actual time spent by the service provider, or could be an average time estimate. Sometimes it's difficult to ask CEO and CFO to fill the timeline, time sheets. It could be an average time estimate. It could also be based on headcount, transaction values, number of users in terms of IT, number of service, tickets, or it could be a combination of different keys. Most important thing which we said, you know, when services have been rendered, there needs to be evidences and documentation, the two arms of the tree. When we say evidences, how would you prove that service have been rendered? You need to keep record of the email correspondence that, okay, there had been quarterly review, there have been bi-weekly review. How do we prove that? Email correspondences, proof of the presentations, any training materials, any presentation slides, minutes of the meeting, how many meetings happened, how many tickets raised and resolved, any analysis been conducted, those need to be part of your transfer pricing as an evidence that services have been rendered. Documentation, obviously the project papers, the guidelines, the framework, the templates, the marketing templates or various templates being used, the finance templates, accounting bookkeeping, which parent company or the related company has provided to the related company, those could be used as a doc as for the documentation as an evidences. Last but not the least is the TP controversy section. We thought of, you know, uh, there's we have been seeing the spurt of TP audit, but there have been recently the first transfer pricing case in Ireland, which has been uh, recently published in May 2024. Since 2011, this is one of the first transfer pricing case, which was educated by Irish Tax Appeal Commissioner. So we thought it's prudent that we share with you how revenue is dealing, how aggressive it is. And now Ireland is also one of the entity where we have tax court cases and those tax appeal commission has given its jurisdiction in favor of 
happily taxpayer. So the case primarily, it's an Irish subsidiary of a US parent company, primarily involved in sales, marketing, and R&D services to the US parent company. The Irish subsidiary for the services rendered to the US parent company charges a cost plus 10% markup and uses the traditional transaction rate margin where we perform benchmarking and economic analysis. Irish revenue has agreed with that. It's not in dispute. They have said this is fine. You can use the TNMM method. You can plus plus ten percent is also fine. Now the point in question is that Iris subsidiary had not included us in the cost basis stock based compensation. Now the U.S. parent has directly paid to the Iris employees of the Iris company a stock based compensation. The Iris entity has not incurred any cost in providing the stock based compensation. The U.S. parent has directly provided the stock-based compensation to the Irish employees of the Irish entity. Now, this was granted between 2015 to 2018. And I, as per the Irish financial reporting system, you know, they need to include the stock-based compensation in the income statement. As per the reporting standards of FRS 100 to. So Irish revenues, as we said, you know, loss-making entity is one of the key triggers for audit being conducted. Here also the Irish revenue raised assessment while audit and found that if we don't include the stock-based compensation, the Irish local entity would be consistently making losses and will never make profits. Hence, they'll not be paying the fair share of tax. And loss-making was one of the key criteria for audit. So Irish revenue obviously uh, made adjustment and said, Stock based compensation, though it is notional, since it is included in the income statement, it needs to be included in the cost because this is at the end of the day a cost incurred by the group providing the services, and hence this needs to be included in the cost basis and the markup needs to be charged. Now, the question which it went obviously went to the appeal commission and the Irish tech asked Can Irish accounting treatment dictate whether stock based compensation? economically borne by a U.S. parent, paid to Irish subsidiary, employs a TP adjustment. If this is an economic cost, which borne by U.S. parent and not by the Irish. Because of the Irish accounting treatment, can a stock-based compensation, which is economically again borne by the U.S. parent, paid to Irish subsidiary's employee, justifies a TP adjustment? This is very interesting. So the commissioner looked into that, and as we keep saying, you know, OECD TP guidelines is the base of Irish TP framework, the Irish TP regulation. The commissioner looked into whether the issuance of stock-based compensation by the U.S. parent actually created an economic cost for Irish sub. That didn't. There was no economic cost for Irish sub. The cost was at the U.S. parent. The commissioner also relied on the OECD TP guidelines and determined functional analysis, which is the basis of any related party transaction, who performs the function, who employs the asset, and who bears the risk. In terms of stock risk compensation, I concluded that it is the U.S. parent who is actually on a sole basis is providing the stock risk compensation. Any risk related to stock risk will be borne by the U.S. parent. So the asset is of U.S. parent. So primarily, they concluded that based on the detailed evidence and the robust functional analysis, which is one of the key which we keep requesting taxpayers that we need to perform a robust function analysis that went into the advantage of the taxpayer. The U.S. parent had not only borne the risk of stock based compensation, but deployed asset and hence the necessary function to administer the plan. Hence, the commission favored the OECD approach of functional analysis over deferring to accounting treatment, the Irish local treatment. As the accounting treatment, the term used was, I, accounting treatment is blind to the question, who bears the legal and economic risk? So as we discussed initially, you know, where is the legal and economic, the legal and economic risk lies with the US bank, since US bank is actually bearing the cost on a standalone basis, and Ireland is not bearing any economic cost in it. Hence, the commissioner went on to note the SBA should be considered as a notional cost in the accounts of parent, and the arm's length principle required that they are excluded from the cost base in providing the services, as it is clearly justified in, 
in the service agreement. So what exactly we can conclude from this? The correct accountant treatment was applied under FRS 102. The accounting treatment did not deal with the key question. From a TV perspective, who bear the legal and economic risk and who should be entitled to earn the profit in accordance with OECD guidelines? And as we clearly saw, TAC dealt in terms of as suggested in the OECD TP guidelines, the T based on the robust function analysis, the US parents actually bears the economic risk. And hence, there's no economic cost in terms of Irish local entity. Hence, that should not be included in the cost. And this is one of the landmark first ever case since 2011 uh, when the TP legislation was applied. So it's a win win yay for our tax taxpayers. And we think that this will go on a long way because globally we have seen different judgments in different entities on the similar kind of cases. But this is going to be going a long way in terms of Irish TP jurisdiction. Again, there are several TP audits being currently being conducted, parallelly going on. The global controversy is on rise, as we discussed. So finally, from the world, what are the key takeaways? What are the challenges and opportunities in 2000? So business in Ireland definitely faced new challenges and opportunities because there is updated TP guidelines where their advanced APA guidelines have become come into picture. There is a guidelines on economic outbound payment. So there should not be a double non-taxation. So now there will be withholding tax to various payments being made. Digital first approach. Now there is an online filing of APA with clear guidelines what taxpayer duty and tax authority role would be there in the latest APA guidelines. Irish taxpayers need to understand the updated manuals. It is very crucial to understand the nuances of the TP manual, especially 3501-05, which deals with the TP documentation submission. Then, as we discussed, the TP landscape in Ireland is evolving. It is getting in line with the global inclusive IIF, inclusive framework of the OECD TP guidelines. So Ireland wants to be in the top. It has already discussed on pillar two. We are almost there with pillar two guidelines provided by the OECD. Ireland has also negotiated that 750 million, the minimum alternative tax of 15% as the inclusive framework of the OECD TP guidelines applies to large taxpayers, 750 million euros and above. But for the companies whose group revenue is less than 750 million and less, they can still pay the Irish 12.5% tax of the trading transactions. So Ireland has negotiated with OECD in that, with following the global trends of 15% alternative minimum alternative tax for high taxpayers, 750 million above. Um, there's a significant phase in TP valuation, as we already said, there's had been updated guidelines, there have been updated manuals, there have been updated APA guidelines, there have been updated uh, 3501-05 manual, which talks about what the large taxpayer division would consider when they do a tax intervention with the taxpayers. We are anticipating further development. It's very classified that any future TP guidelines provided by OECD TP guidelines, the Finance Act 2023 says that that will be automatically integrated in the TP guidelines of Ireland. Most important, the last two lines is reinforcing tax integrity. The revenue updates to tax manual represent a strategic step towards Ireland's tax integrity. So any negative news, this is to counter negative news that yes, Ireland is a good place for business, but Ireland promotes and it is paying fair share of tax and still wants to be a business friendly country. A critical aspect of tax strategies, TP will remain a critical aspect of tax strategy for business navigating with the complex global landscape. Everyday things are being change, changing and Ireland is not far apart from the global. So TP will be one of the key areas. With that, I conclude. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions before I can pass on to Victoria. Mm, I don't think we have any questions from our guests. 
Victoria. So maybe I'll pass on to you for the tech, tax and technology section, which Victoria is a partner. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks, Raj. Um, I think we booked until 12, so I've got eight minutes, which is very little time to do any justice to the tech side of, of tax and TP. And I'm very grateful to Raj for his thorough analysis and really interesting uh, feedback. Um, so I'll try and race through what um, what in a, in a nutshell where the where the tax tech aspects of TP are. Um, and at Regan Van Roy, we we are we we believe in human led and, and tech empowered, and we really believe that this is how businesses of today should be managed. Um, there's no tech that can replace the human creativity, empathy, leadership, and all the things that Raj was talking about in terms of, of controversy and the cases that are coming out. There's no tech that can make those judgment calls. It can only really follow a set of predefined rules and patterns. So it's looking at how do we use that capability to take away the mundane, time-consuming, rule-based tasks from our TP to-do to lists just to make our lives easier and our days more fulfilling. So, Raj, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, just quickly, the key, the key areas that we see are, are the places that are to automate for TP are data collection, benchmarking, and document retention. Um, what we find is that very often for tax, the data that we need for TP is, is not easily accessible. It's often not granularly enough, and we generally rely on other departments to pr provide us with the data. Often we get it too late, and it can be the wrong version of the data, um, and that's not even going into the external data that's needed for benchmarking. And how do we look to solve this is using integration into the financial systems and direct extraction of data from centralized data warehouses so that the tax team can access it themselves um, at the right version at the right time. And I think it's important to note that if you're going to do that, the tax team needs to be involved in the data architecture discussions in the organization to make sure that the right data that you need is going to be accessible and in that data warehouse. Um, often intercompany data is not accessible or, or easily extractable as an example. So to make sure that that specific data is isolated and easily obtainable from a data warehouse. Um, looking at benchmarking, again, it can take a long time to gather all the data needed for, for benchmarking, especially the comparable data for arm's length comparison, uh, relevant industry information across geographic lo locations, and the amount of data to be gathered is, is obviously vast. Um, and running calculations and preparing preliminary reports can be automated um, if you build in links to those reports to the ex external data sources directly, and those reports can be automatically refreshed. So that's another area that um, is, is quite key for, for automation. And then another one that's really basic, you would think um, document retention and I think because it sounds so elementary, it's very often overlooked. And we often see taxpayers receiving audit queries and don't have the right documentation at their fingertips, um, scrabbling to find information, um, even emails um, that can be in support of a position that they've taken. Again, the volumes of data are vast, and it can be a minefield trying to locate all these documents. Um, it is something that is relatively straightforward to implement a document retention strategy with automated workflows built in trackers for tasks and predefined folder structures. And I think it's important that the team is able to collaborate on that, um, those, those workflows and where the documents are stored. And, um, you know, I think the thing that that springs to mind that's quite an easy one is to do that in SharePoint because it's something that most teams would have access to already. So it's just having a strategy and how to, to create that workflow and retention strategy with the predefined folder structures on the systems that you've already got. Sorry, I'm really trying to go through these um, quickly. So uh, on the next slide, I've got... Um, thoughts about what can you do? So how do we automate um, for TP? And I'm sure you all know that there's a, a lot of third-party solutions available in the market that provide a really wide array of services. 
And typically you can choose one or two of them, or you can go for the whole shebang with all the bells and whistles where there are solutions that provide end-to-end -end compliance. Um, and those um, aspects that are covered are generally referring back to the three that we covered already around automated data extraction, where they have direct a a APIs into the ERP systems um, and into other data sources where it's, it's much easier to get accurate and consistent data. Um, other things that they also bring in is uh, some of them have transaction monitoring, which is really useful, uh, real-time monitoring to be able to track your intercompany transactions real-time, um, benchmarking that they do automatically searching for comparable companies and transactions to establish your arm's length pricing. They do the automatic financial ratio analysis for you. And one that I see... Um, Quite a quite a high uptake on is the automated policy documentation. So these solutions that help maintain and update the transfer pricing policies and the documentation. So automated local file master file preparation, obviously at a preliminary level, that um, gives you a skeleton that you can then flesh out um, for for yourselves and in, into the format that you that works for you. Um, CBCR is another, uh, another common one, um, which is easier to automate um, pulling the data into predefined templates for the submission and conversion into XML. Um, um, there's lots, and I'm just I'm just trying to rush through. So another good one is the scenario planning and forecasting. So be able, being able to bring in your forecasts into your um, strategy to be able to see where the, where the organization is going and to think ahead of the time what's going to, what what your arm's length pricing and so on should be rather than at the end. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I just see you've really, really moved on to the, the other way to do it is not to go with the big cloud solutions that are available from third party vendors, but to be able to build yourselves. And often it's if you don't have the budget or inclination to buy the cloud-based solutions, there is a lot that you can do with um, what is called small automation, which is really the implementation of, of simpler, more targeted solutions to, to streamline specific tasks or processes within the end-to-end -end TP process cycle. Um, so it just focuses on incremental improvements rather than a big overhaul. And the benefits of that is that it's much easier to implement and it's much quicker providing your be your benefits um, much sooner than if you're going to try and implement a big solution. Um, it's obviously much more cost effective. Um, and because it's bespoke and um, built for you, you get exactly what you want rather than one solution trying to fit, fit all, as it were. Um, I think... Um, yeah, this the next slide um, was was also around what what the the benefits are, um, and I think um, you can see from the slide what they are. But um, it's it's pretty much around the cost, being able to scale piece by piece. So you build a piece and then you add on as you go. So very much able to to be adaptable and flexible for, for your requirements. And it's not as complex. It doesn't need to be as complex as a big cloud um, deployment. So that is a nice way to go about it um, and, and just think about being able to break down the process into smaller chunks. Where can you automate within that process and then break it down into milestones and eventually you can automate the whole end-to-end -end process. Um, so... Yeah, any questions? Um, we have kind of run out of time. So if you would like to reach out to either Raj or myself, please, we'd love to hear from you. Get your feedback, any questions, if you want any help with any of the things that we've spoken about from a tech automation perspective or um, any of the controversy and um, case studies that uh, Raj has referred to, we'd really love to hear from you. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and, and thanks so much for your time. <laughs>